right, well, good morning, you guys. Thanks for, um, thanks for patience, I appreciate it. So today we're gonna to talk about retinal detachments and predisposing lesions, maybe. Okay. All right, does that look okay? All right, so we'll talk about retinal breaks and the things that predispose to retinal detachments. We'll also talk about prophylactic treatment of retinal breaks and lattice degeneration and things like that, as well as the differential diagnosis, and then we'll throw an optic pit maculopathy at the end. So uh, retinal breaks, uh, as you probably have been exposed to to some degree or another, uh, are composed of a, a variety of types. So they're flap or horseshoe tears, they're giant retinal tears, operculated holes, dialyses, and atrophic holes. And each of these carry with them a certain propensity to cause retinal detachments. Some are more threatening and worrisome than others. Others are relatively benign and you can kind of watch them. But the main concern is that liquefied vitreous will pass through these tears or breaks in the retina and get underneath the retina, causing the retina to separate away from the underlying retinal ep pigmented epithelium. So a flap tear is also known as a horseshoe tear. And this is where a strip of retina is pulled anteriorly. And so one thing to keep in mind with uh, horseshoe tears is that the horse is always walking towards the optic nerve. And that's kind of how you can orient uh, flap tears or horseshoe tears is that the horse is always walking towards the optic nerve. Usually uh, these are symptomatic when they're associated with uh, photopsies or floaters. The, the thing that's uh, really alarming is when somebody has a giant retinal tear because these are hard to fix. You try to get the retina back up against the wall of the eye but it has a tendency to slip down towards the optic nerve. So those can be a challenge. This is an example of an operculated hole. You can see how the operculum has pulled completely away from the retina. These are actually less threatening lesions because they've, as they've pulled away and pulled this plug out of the retina, it's alleviated the traction on the retina so you don't worry quite as much about the vitreous pulling on the retina and causing a separation away from the wall of the eye. Uh, retinal dialyses occur when the retina essentially unzips from its origin in the far periphery. These are usually circumferential linear breaks. They're often associated with blunt trauma. Uh, I've seen these associated with soccer ball injuries and tennis ball injuries and all sorts of things. Sometimes people don't know when or how they were injured and they just show up with a, a dialysis. Sometimes it's been there for, some, for a long time. In fact, I just repaired one of these on a 30-year-old female who could never really recall having had any blunt trauma, but she had a large dialysis in her right eye that went from about 6 o'clock up to about 9 o'clock. So it was essentially a giant retinal tear and I ended up putting a buckle on her to repair that sort of uh, tear and the accompanying detachment. So atrophic holes are usually the least threatening of these tears or breaks in the retina. So this is what atrophic holes look like. This is just another shot of a couple of atrophic holes. They're usually not associated with an increased risk of retinal detachment. Once in a while they will progress, so I think it's important to watch them. But they're not always associated with you know, an imminent risk of retinal detachment, and often these are asymptomatic. So somebody comes in for a routine exam, they're seen by their eye doctor out in the community, and they come in and you know, the eye doctor in the community says, oh, they've got a hole in their retina. You look at it, it's a small atrophic hole, and that does not necessarily need to be uh, prof prophylactically treated with laser or cryo. Uh, so traumatic breaks um, can occur as a result of direct retinal per perforation, contusion, or vitreous traction. So, you know, the, especially with blunt trauma where an eye takes, uh, you know, if the eye gets hit with a ball or something like that and rapidly compresses and then decompresses, that puts pressure on the vitreous base and that can result in a tear in the peripheral retina. Uh, horseshoe tears and operculated holes, interesting, are usually not caused by trauma. So, contusion injuries often are, are seen in the inferior temporal or superior nasal quadrants as a result of the coup and uh, contra coup forces. They're often large, ragged, jagged breaks and are sometimes ac accompanied by commotio retinae that you see in the posterior pole. Uh, dialyses, once again, are found way out in the periphery. So you'll see it uh, essentially a peripheral and zipping and they can be relatively small, one orabe up to very large tears uh, in the peripheral retina. And then sometimes you'll see traumatic macular holes as a result of trauma to the eye. I had a, a young man who came to see me a few years ago. He's about 15 years old. He's having a fight with his brother. His brother hit him in the eye with a curtain rod and it caused a traumatic macular hole which we were able to successfully repair. His vision ended up being 20-50, but those are pretty typical cases where somebody takes a, a direct blow to the eye and then develops a traumatic macular hole. Uh, younger eyes are a little bit more prone to trauma and getting breaks in the retina. And 
part of the reason for this is that the jelly, the vitreous jelly, is relatively formed and solid and adherent to the retina. So anything that, that pulls the retina away or pulls the jelly away from the wall of the eye can, can forcibly tear the retina in those cases of blunt trauma in younger folks. And somebody who's older has more liquefied vitreous. The vitreous isn't quite as tightly adherent, and so as a result, uh, usually the, the retina doesn't tear quite as readily, or often they've already got a posterior vitreous separation, so they're not going to get a large posterior break as a result of blunt trauma. So with uh, retinal detachments, uh, often the diagnosis of retinal detachment is delayed. So only 12% in young eyes are identified immediately. Most are identified within 24 months, but you see a lot of people who come in with asymptomatic retinal detachments. They'll have a small peripheral retinal detachment that maybe started years ago, and they were never aware of it. And especially if they've got a, a relatively young eye, then the eye will naturally lay down pigmented demarcation lines to surround and isolate the retinal detachment and keep it from progressing. Sometimes they'll get macrocysts in these little subretinal deposits as well in cases of chronic retinal detachment. So posterior vitreous uh, separation or detachment is often an instigating factor in retinal detachment. We often in our practice call it a vitreous separation because people often confuse the word detachment with retinal detachment. And so you can say it however you'd like, but essentially it's a separation of the vitreous jelly from the back of the eye. Now that stops at the vitreous base. So the vitreous base goes two millimeters anterior to the aura serrata and four millimeters posterior to the aura serrata. And so as a result of that, the vitreous is very tightly adherent in those areas. And so consequently, any force or traction on the vitreous in those areas will tear either the pars plana or tear the peripheral retina because it's so tightly adherent. In fact, one of the things I think one of the real arts of, uh, of uh, doing vitrectomy surgery is learning to shave the vitreous base safely so that you don't go too deep and cut into the retina, but you shave enough so that you don't provide a scaffolding for proliferative vitreal retinopathy. So um, the vitreous is also firmly adherent at the margin of the optic disc in the macula along major vessels at margins of lattice degeneration and also chorioretinal scars. Um, most retinal tears, of course, result from traction of the vitreous, uh, which can happen spontaneously or as a result of a, uh, a traumatic posterior vitreous separation. And of course, the evolution of a retinal tear is that the vitreous jelly is pulled away from the retina which then creates a break in the retina and then fluid liquefied vitreous gets underneath that break and blisters the retina away from the wall of the eye. So uh, posterior vitreous separation can often slowly progress over the course of years. We often think of it as a sudden event because your patients will often come in and say, well, I was sitting there watching the ball game the other night and all of a sudden I noticed a bunch of new floaters and flashes of light in my peripheral vision. So we kind of think of that as a relatively abrupt event, but often it's in evolution for a long time where it started years before, and it usually starts with a liquef uh, liquefaction of the vitreous over the macula, and then the macula kind of starts to pull away, uh, or the, the vitreous jelly pulls away from the macula and eventually separates along the vessels, and then usually it's last to pop off at the optic nerve. But when it pops off at the optic nerve, it often brings with it the telltale sign of the Weiss ring. And that's what you can often see as you look into the eye, as you see the little tiny glial Weiss ring that is floating in the posterior vitreous, usually near the optic nerve. And so this is what a, a Weiss ring looks like. And you've probably seen this in clinic. The other thing that you can do if you can't see a distinct Weiss ring, or sometimes Weiss rings will condense and they just look like a little clump of debris in the back of the eye. So the other thing you can do is you can take your slip beam in the anterior vitreous and kind of direct it diagonally into the anterior vitreous, and then you can see the posterior hyaloid face. And that's also an indication of posterior vitreous separation. The other way to determine whether or not there's a posterior vitreous separation is with um, echography. So you can do an ultrasound of the eye and see whether or not the vitreous is separated away posteriorly. So, um, of course, as we discussed, the vitreous jelly remains attached to the vitreous base, and this can result in traction and so forth. There are many conditions associated with vitreous separation, such as aphakia, inflammatory disease, trauma, vitreous hemorrhage, and myopia. And all of these conditions can predispose people to, um, to a greater risk of posterior vitreous separation. It also increases, the, the prevalence increases with axial length and age. So in autopsy studies, they find that most people over the age of 70 have a vitreous separation. And kind of the rule of thumb that we often use is, 
50% at 50 years old, 60% at 60 years old, 70% at 70 years old, and 80% at 80 years old. And that just simply indicates that, that as we age, we're more and more likely to develop a vitreous separation. And then, of course, uh, lens status affects the prevalence of posterior vitreous separation as well. So if you have a, a nice fake emulsification with an intact posterior capsule, the risk of getting a vitreous separation is only about 40%. But if you have to do an, an intracap, uh, the risk of posterior vitreous separation incre increases dramatically. It's uh, almost twice as much. So the typical symptoms are flashes and photopsies. Sometimes patients will also kind of say that they see a gauzy type cobweb over their central vision, which can be very annoying to them. Typically, the symptoms will settle down and kind of subside over the course of a few months. They'll get better and better with time. Uh, but often they always have some little persistent floaters, and then you can go in, and if they're still symptomatic, you can do YAG vitriolysis or sometimes a vitrectomy, and that's a little bit controversial. I think uh, in some ways the, the jury's still out on vitrectomy for vitreous floaters, but it's something that I do all the time often. <laughs> Those are my happiest patients, and, and fortunately the, the risk is uh, very, very low. Uh, your main risks, of course, being the chance of getting a retinal tear detachment or endophthalmitis or sometimes hemorrhage in the eye. But you know, the chance of any of those things happening is very, very tiny. And like I say, in the cases that I've done of floaters for, uh, or vitrectomy for floaters, patients are often very, very happy with the outcome. So um, vitreous hemorrhage is a very uh, ominous sign in the case of a posterior vitreous separation. The reason it's ominous is it just is associated with a much higher risk of developing a retinal tear or detachment. So. Uh, in general, there's about a 15% risk of having a tear in the setting of a symptomatic posterior vitreous separation. If somebody has blood in the eye, then there's a 70% risk of there being a tear. If they don't have any vitreous hemorrhage, then there's only about a 10% risk. And then, of course, the other sign to look for is tobacco dust in the anterior vitreous. If they've got tobacco dust, uh, it, well, if they've got a tear in the retina, they're about seven times more likely to have tobacco dust in the anterior vitreous. So the gold standard, I think, is scleral depression uh, with the indirect ophthalmoscope. In Europe, apparently, they use the three-mirror lens a little bit more and feel like that's an effective way to do it. But the thing about doing indirect ophthalmoscopy with scleral depression is that you can actually, the dynamic aspect of that exam is really important because you can get your depressor back there and roll it back and forth over the suspected area of pathology. And if there is a flap tear, you can see the flap lift up. And so I personally think that scleral depression is the gold standard for examining the peripheral, uh, peripheral retina. And, and you know, you can do the, the wide angle photographs, you can do three mirror, photo, uh, three mirror examination, but none of those, I think, really replicates the dynamic exam that you can get with indirect ophthalmoscopy with scleral depression. Um, if somebody does have a vitreous separation, you should re-examine them generally in Two, this says two to four weeks, but I think two to six weeks is acceptable. And I usually just tell them that there's some risk of developing a tear in the interim. So, you know, we're kind of looking for a couple of reasons. Number one, we want to make sure we didn't miss anything on the first go around. But number two, we want to make sure that you haven't developed a tear in the interim. And if you have developed a new tear or something like that, then we can address it. We can treat it with laser or take you to the operating room. Uh, there are risk factors, of course, as we already discussed, uh, aphakia, myopia, family history of retinal detachment, or signs of Stickler syndrome, such as radial lattice degeneration. And I always just caution patients and telling them that if they do notice any new symptoms, a lot of new floaters, photopsias, or any enlarging peripheral visual field defects, that they need to come back in right away. Um, so the options for following a patient with vitreous hemorrhage in these settings is you can follow them closely, you can do echography, or you can do kind of an exploratory vitrectomy. Uh, usually if you follow them closely, the blood will kind of start to settle down and then you can see peripheral retinal pathology. But let's say somebody comes in with a dense vitreous hemorrhage, you can't see the periphery very well and you're not quite sure what's going on. I always do an ultrasound in those cases just to make sure that the peripheral retina is okay. And then we'll often let the blood settle down over the course of a few days and then have them come back and see if we can see the peripheral retina a little bit better so that we can find maybe a small tear that didn't show up on echography. Because sometimes the small little flat tears admittedly are a little hard to find and identify on echography. And uh, it's not that you should skip that step, uh, but I think the combination of following them closely in echography is the right way to do it. And then sometimes you get to the point where you've done echography, you've followed them closely, they still have vitreous hemorrhage, you're not sure what's caused it, 
and then going to the operating room for exploratory vitrectomy to find out whether they've got a branch retinal vein occlusion or maybe like a peripheral crotal neovascular membrane that's caused breakthrough bleeding into the vitreous cavity or something like that has been the source of, of the vitreous hemorrhage. And sometimes you just don't know until you get in there. So these are the lesions that predispose eyes to retinal detachment. So I think this is an important thing to kind of make note of. So lattice degeneration does. Uh, vitreo retinal tufts, cystic and zonular tufts, will, will predispose an eye to retinal detachment. Re meridional folds and closed aura bays and peripheral retinal excavation. So lattice degeneration is fairly common. It's present in about 7% of the population. Um, but it's found in a significant number of eyes with retinal detachment and it predisposes people to developing retinal breaks and detachment. It's bilateral in about a third to a half of cases and it's more common in myop myopic eyes. Uh, often in patients with lattice degeneration, you'll see one of two types of breaks. You'll see either atrophic holes within the lattice degeneration or you'll see a traction tear at the margin of lattice degeneration. If you see somebody with atrophic holes within lattice degeneration, they're asymptomatic and don't have any subretinal fluid, those cases do not necessarily need to be laser demarcated. But if they're symptomatic and they've got a traction tear at the margin of lattice degeneration, I would demarcate 100% of those. Uh, those are high-risk lesions and have a great tendency to progress towards retinal detachment. Um, the risk of pro progression, of course, is more or greater in younger patients with myopia. And then often uh, the challenge is, is that they're sometimes asymptomatic, especially if they have atrophic holes. And you may have seen retinal detachments like this, but sometimes you'll see these young patients who come in, they're 27 years old, they had no idea they ever had anything wrong with their eyes. And you'll look in there and they'll have a retinal detachment that's come right up to fixation, it's right at the fovea, and they'll, they'll have just started to notice it within the last few days. But clearly, you know, they'll have had multiple demarcated pigment lines that it's broken through. They'll have some atrophic holes in the periphery. And they don't have a vitreous separation in many cases in that setting. And so it's kind of like the stealth RD that starts to form. And it comes in from the peripheral vision. And, and they just don't notice it until it's really close to the center point. And so those are ones that you kind of have to watch for. Those are actually patients that are often uh, very nicely treated with the scleral buckle. The reason for that is that if they've got lattice degeneration and you go in with the vitrectomy and do a vitrectomy, the vitrectomy itself creates some tension or traction on the peripheral retina, including the areas of lattice degeneration, which can lead to more breaks. If you do a scleral buckle, then you're not messing with the, the lattice degeneration in the periphery. You don't have to induce a PVD. You can just put on a buckle and do cryo, and often younger patients respond really well to that. In fact, there are a number of good papers showing that younger patients with an intact posterior hyaloid without a posterior vitreous separation and small atrophic holes do better with the scleral buckle. So for those of you who are interested in retina, don't just throw the buckle aside. Uh, a lot of people are kind of saying that at this point. And there are some programs that don't even teach um, uh, training doctors how to do a buckle. But I still think that it's an important tool in our armamentarium, especially in cases like that. So there are three types of tufts. Uh, there are non-cystic tufts, cystic tufts, and zonular traction retinal tufts. So the cystic and zonular traction tufts can predispose to retinal breaks and retinal detachment, but usually the non-cystic tufts don't. And so when you look in there and you see a little non-cystic tuft, it just looks like a little tiny nubbin in the peripheral retina. It's often close to the aura serrata. A cystic tuft is usually a little bit more elevated. It's a little bit more pronounced and often has some pigment surrounding it. So this is an example of a little, some little cystic tufts. And um, you know, once again, these are very benign and don't progress to retinal detachment. Uh, this is, or I'm sorry, those are just, uh, the previous ones are retinal tufts. This is a cystic tuft that's a little bit more elevated. It's hard to see, I think, the cyst within it. But the way I would distinguish those two is that the cystic tuft is just a little bit more elevated and often has pigment associated with it. And these are associated with retinal breaks. Sometimes, for instance, I saw one of these a few months ago and the patient came in um, a month or two later and had a retinal detachment that had resulted from a tear right in that area where the cystic tuft was. So usually we don't treat them prophylactically, but they are something to watch. Uh, this is a zonular traction tuft where you've got a little zonule that's come back here and is pulling on the peripheral retina. And once again, that does predispose to retinal detachment and tears. Uh, meridional folds can also do this in closed aura bays and peripheral retinal excavations. Uh, some people think this is probably a mild form of lattice degeneration. So sometimes you'll look in there and you'll see this funny stuff in the peripheral retina. It doesn't have the classic lattice appearance. 
appearance, but it does, uh, probably is consistent with like a peripheral retinal excavation. And this does also predispose people to developing a retinal detachment. But it doesn't have the, the classic kind of hallmark features of lattice degeneration with the white lattice like vessels as well as the pigmentary changes that uh, you can see with lattice degeneration. So this is an enclosed aura bay. And I don't have examples of the others, sorry. Um, so these are the things that do not predispose patients to uh, retinal detachment. So cobblestone degeneration is a very common finding where you'll see little atrophic spots in the peripheral retina. And these are more and more, they become more and more prevalent as patients age. So it just looks like little cobblestones, little atrophic spots throughout the peripheral retina, more focused in the inferior peripheral retina. But these lesions do not predispose patients to retinal detachment. Uh, they look kind of scary and look kind of weird. But actually, uh, they often represent a greater adhesion between the retina and the underlying tissue. So often, if there is a retinal detachment, it will stop at the area of, uh, of uh, paving stone or cobblestone degeneration. And then peripheral cystoid degeneration is kind of like um, schesis. It's like a mild form of schesis. And that doesn't predispose patients to retinal detachment either, per se. So um, we already talked about cobblestone degeneration, but it's, it's quite prevalent. It happens in about a quarter of people over the age of 20 and increases with, with age. So this is an example of cobblestone degeneration. You can see the little atrophic spots in the peripheral retina. And uh, once again, these are never the site of a primary retinal break. Um, retinal hyperplasia can occur when there's traction on the peripheral retina. And so if you've got a cystic tuft where there's a little bit of traction, then you can get RPE hyperplasia in this. Once again, it's seen in tufts and lattice degeneration. It can also be seen in areas of previous inflammation and trauma. Sometimes you'll see a spontaneously regressed retinal detachment. So if somebody had a couple of atrophic holes, they get a small retinal detachment. Every once in a while, as a result of a young, formed, vitreous, and intact posterior hyaloid, they'll get an internal tamponade that will kind of self-treat that retinal detachment. So you'll see an area of pigmentary hyperplasia uh, that kind of looks like it could be in the configuration of a retinal detachment, but it's just simply the result of having uh, had the retinal detachment spontaneously resolve. Um, hypertrophy occurs more with aging and is often seen in a net-like or reticular pattern in the peripheral retina. And the histologic features in this case are similar to chirpy. Peripheral cystoid degeneration, like I said, this is kind of like a, a mild form of schesis, and you see these little cyst-like lesions in the peripheral retina. And uh, it can develop or turn into kind of full-blown retina schesis, which becomes a little bit more obvious. So with regard to prophylactic treatment of retinal breaks, uh, a lot of breaks don't cause retinal detachment. So the things that would make you want to treat a, a break is if it's threatening, like if it's a horseshoe tear, especially in the superior periphery, you worry about fluid getting underneath that tear and causing the retina to detach. Uh, the other thing that you'd worry about is, is seeing subretinal fluid. Anytime you see subretinal fluid around a blurt break, you worry that it can progress or will progress to retinal detachment. Um, retinal detachment itself is fairly rare. It's only about one out of 10,000 or one out of 15,000 people um, per year. And so less than 1% of people will ever have a retinal detachment in their lifetime. And of course, the goal of prophylactic treatment is to create a chorioretinal adhesion around the tear. You can't fix the tear directly, but you can wall it off and isolate it. Um, so things to kind of watch for, like we talked about, symptomatic retinal breaks. Uh, if they're asymptomatic, you probably don't need to treat them. Sometimes we talk about the prophylactic treatment of lattice degeneration. Aphakia and pseudophakia increase the risk of developing a retinal detachment. If somebody's had a retinal detachment in one eye already, then that makes you a little bit more prone to uh, prophylactically treating somebody who's got peripheral retinal breaks or pathology. And then uh, if they've got a subclinical retinal detachment, that's also a good, good thing to treat as well. So, um, so with symptomatic retinal breaks, uh, like we talked about, in a symptomatic posterior vitreous separation, about 15% of eyes will have a uh, retinal break. If somebody's got an opercolated hole, they're less likely to detach because there's no residual traction. If there are atrophic holes and they're asymptomatic, it's usually not a big deal. Even if they've got an, uh, an acute PVD, I usually don't treat those unless I see subretinal fluid associated with the atrophic holes. So this is just, uh, and th these are slides that you can look at or review later if you want. I'll try to leave a copy with somebody. But 
Anyway, um, with horseshoe tears, you almost always want to treat those with a dialysis. You always want to treat it. On a percolated hole, if they're symptomatic, I treat those. Uh, an atrophic hole, I don't treat it unless they have subretinal fluid. And then lattice degeneration that does not have any associated tears, usually we don't prophylactically treat that unless, unless they've got a retinal detachment or have had a retinal detachment in the other eye, then I'll be a little bit more likely to treat them uh, with laser demarcation. So uh, with asymptomatic flap tears, often these do not cause a retinal detachment, but if they're symptomatic at all, I always treat them. And I guess the way I look at it is I'd rather treat them and err on the side of treatment because really the treatment's pretty benign. You know, the treatment usually doesn't cause any symptoms. Uh, the, the worst that can happen is they'll have a little peripheral field defect, but usually it's so far peripherally located that they never notice a peripheral field defect. Um, like I, and like we discussed, if they're asymptomatic, um, usually we, we don't treat those. So um, with lattice degeneration, once again, the, the, it's a little bit debatable whether or not it requires prophylactic treatment. Have you seen, those of you who've rotated through the retina service here, do you usually see the retina attendings prophylactically treat lattice degeneration? Do they usually do it in the, the uh, fellow eye that's had a retinal detachment? Yes. They do? I almost always do that. And, and the reason being is that, especially if the patient's been macula off and their vision ends up being like 2070 or 2080 in the eye that had the mac off detachment, and now they've got their other eye that's got lattice degeneration, I, I think that it's a good idea to go ahead and put some laser treatment around the areas of lattice degeneration. And I think there are two reasons for that. One reason is that, um, number one, it might prevent them from developing breaks or tears in the peripheral retina in the event of a posterior vitreous separation. But the second reason is, is that even if it doesn't completely prevent that, it will often prevent or limit the extent of a retinal detachment if they were to get one, and at least slow it down so that it doesn't just march through the macula and cause another mac off detachment. So uh, aphakic and pseudophakic eyes, of course, have a higher risk of developing tears and detachment. A subclinical retinal detachment is one in the peripheral retina that uh, has uh, fluid that extends at least one disc diameter from the break, but not more than two disc diameters posterior to the equator. I just retook the boards for my you know, 10 year anniversary or whatever where I had to recertify. This was a question on the boards. So anyway, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, what, what actually constitutes a subclinical retinal detachment? A number of these will progress, so I always laser demarcate these. Uh, I don't think there's any reason not to. If it looks like it's fairly aggressive and it's, you know, they're really symptomatic and it's moving quickly, then I think that laser treatment, they probably in many cases need more than laser treatment because often if you set up a laser barrier, it will break through the laser barrier. So if somebody's had symptoms for just the last couple of days, they've got a retinal detachment superiorly and it's extending, you know, let's say two, two disc diameters posterior to the, to the equator, I think in general those either need a pneumatic retinopexy or a vitrectomy or a buckle. They need something that's often a little bit more definitive than, than laser treatment. But if they've got an inferior retinal detachment, those usually progress much more slowly. So let's say they've had symptoms for a month or two, you look in there, it's an inferior retinal detachment. I think that those can be safely laser demarcated because they don't usually progress quite as quickly. So uh, with retinal detachment, three types, regmatogenous, which means there's a break in the retina, tractional or exudative, and uh, the differential diagnosis in these cases is schesis tumors and, and uh, choroidal detachment or elevation. So this is one that I often see referrals uh, from doctors in the community about, is whether or not it's a retinal detachment or whether or not it's schesis. And we'll go over the distinction here in just a minute. But uh, there are the... Uh, kind of quintessential link-off rules that help you to locate a break. Have you guys heard of the link-off rules for locating a retinal break in the setting of retinal detachment? So these are the link-off rules. So you look at the higher side of the retinal detachment, so if this side's lower and this side's higher, then there's a very high chance that it will be located within one and a half clock hours of uh, the top part of the retinal detachment. Uh, if if it's uh, fairly equal and uh, kind of coming down on either side like this, there's a very high chance it will be within the top two, uh, one and a half to two clock hours. If it's an inferior detachment, and once again, one side's a little higher than the other, then it's almost always gonna be on the higher side. I and mean, really, the intuitive approach to the Linkoff rules is whatever side is higher is where the rental detachment's gonna be. And then, uh, sometimes we'll get an inferior bolus detachment. If that's the case, you have to look for guttering around the peripheral retina. And I actually did see a case like this where, 
young man came in with an inferior peripheral, um, inferior bolus retinal detachment in the inferior periphery. In fact, I just did a buckle on him last week. And the only break I could find was a little tiny break right up at 12 o'clock. And he had, once again, kind of this guttering appearance around uh, the retinal periphery. So proliferative retinal, uh, vitreal retinopathy is uh, kind of the bane of retinal surgeons. It occurs in about one out of 20 cases of retinal detachment, so about 5%. And this is just where they get massive uh, fibrous proliferation on the surface of the retina. And it kind of scrunches the retina up, causing star folds and causing the retina to become stiff. And it's hard then, in those cases, to iron out the retina. But, uh, you know, this is something that we try ev to do everything that we can to prevent in the operating room. And I think that's one of the reasons, one of the arguments for doing a very thorough vitrectomy with scleral depression and carefully shaving the vitreous base and just doing everything that you can to prevent this. If you leave a lot of vitreous in a vitrectomy, then it does, in theory, provide some scaffolding for the glial cells, uh, scar tissue forming cells to crawl across and then potentially create proliferative vitreal retinopathy. But it is the most common cause of retinal detachment repair failure. So this is uh, one grading system, kind of the most commonly used grading system for proliferative vitreal retinopathy. So uh, grade A is just haze and pigment clumps in the vitreous. B is where they start to get some uh, wrinkling of the inner retinal surface, but they don't yet have fixed folds. CP is, uh, P, P stands for posterior, so that means posterior to the equator. And that means that they've got fixed folds posterior to the equator. And CA, A referring to anterior, means that they've often got anterior loop traction. Once again, if you leave a lot of vitreous in the peripheral retina, then what can happen is they can get anterior loop traction where the vitreous contracts in the periphery and kind of pulls the peripheral retina up towards the ciliary body. And those are really hard to treat because then you have to get in there and essentially dissect out uh, the peripheral retina where that anterior loop traction is or sometimes you end up doing a, a retinectomy, but those are not optimal cases. So this is a, a case of proliferative vitreal retinopathy. So what grade would you say that this patient has a proliferative vitreal retinopathy? So 1 through 12 is the clock hours, and I'm sorry I didn't mention that. So, so if they've got a total of like three clock hours of um, proliferative vitreal retinopathy or star folds, that would be like CP3, referring to the three clock hours of star folds. So, so this patient has a fixed fold here, fixed fold here, fixed fold here. And it looks to me like it's pretty much all posterior. It's hard to photograph anterior loop traction. But if you just had to take a stab at it, what would you say this grade of proliferative vitreal retinopathy is? What's that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a very good thought. So, you know, it does, it kind of goes from about maybe 4 o'clock over here to uh, about 9, 9.30. So, yeah, CP 5 or 6, somewhere in that ballpark. I think you're exactly right. So how about this one? What would you call this one? It's more anterior, so it's CA. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's an excellent thought. It doesn't look like it goes too far anterior, and, and you know, once again, it's really hard to photograph anterior PVR uh, just because it's so far out there. I mean, I guess you could do it with maybe some of the wide-angle ones, but there just aren't a lot of good photographs of anterior PVR. Um, <clears throat> but this one is, looks like it's posterior to the equator. So one way that you can orient yourself when you're looking at a fundus is you can find the vortex veins, and the vortex veins in each of the four quadrants will usually indicate where the equator is. And then that kind of helps you to know whether it's posterior to the equator or anterior to the equator. Uh, this one looks to me like it's probably about, the, the focus of the star fold is maybe about seven to eight millimeters temporal to the fovea, which is probably still in the posterior range. So I'd probably say that this is CP, PVR. And then how many clock hours do you think that is? Yeah, yeah, I think that's as good a guess as any. So it's probably by CP4 PVR. What you find sometimes is, you know, you take a photograph of PVR, and what you'll find when you get into the operating room is that there are a lot of fixed membranes and folds right around here, but then these little tendrils coming out are just kind of uh, the photographic artifact from that retina kind of being drawn in. So you don't necessarily always find membranes here on these little extensions, but uh, usually you find the bulk of the membranes right here. So. Anyway, uh, with uh, the, the management of retinal detachment, of course, is that you find all the breaks and you treat them. It's very important to do a good preoperative and postoperative exam. So you know what you're getting into because your technique uh, 
your approach is going to change once you get into the operating room or once you know what's going on. And, and so you kind of need to come up with an operative plan. Are you going to do a scleral buckler? Are you going to do a vitrectomy? Are you going to do a combined scleral buckle with vitrectomy? Are you going to need forceps so that you can peel membranes off the surface of the retina? Uh, are you going to need gas or oil? Um, you know, what are you going to need? What instruments are you going to need in the operative room, uh, operating room? And it's just kind of, you know, it's like that with any case you do. If you go into a complex cataract with a small pupil, you might need a malugan ring or you might need ICG or something to stain the anterior capsule. I mean, it's just kind of the, that whole approach. So you kind of just have to get in the mode of looking at the pathology preoperatively and trying to figure out and anticipate what you'll need intraoperatively. Um, this is an example of a scleral buckle and it being sutured to the wall of the eye. This is what a buckle looks like inside. You see that little ridge. Um, and this is how a buckle works. You do cry over the, the area of pathology and then sew the buckle to the out of the eye. So it's kind of an outside-in approach. Now you can also do a pneumatic retinopexy which corks the break internally. The best candidates for this, uh, for pneumatic retinopexy, are, are eyes that are phacic usually and have breaks in the superior two-thirds of the retina. Although I have to say, if they're, if they're below the horizontal meridian, I'm often pretty reluctant to do a pneumatic retinopexy. I think those have a pretty high failure rate. Um, so I, I'm a little bit reluctant. And I think with, with modern vitrectomy, I, I think that the, maybe it's, it's harder to justify doing a pneumatic retinopexy in some of these cases that are a little more questionable. Um, this is an example of pneumatic retinopexy. Some people do cryo treatment at the same time they do the pneumatic retinopexy, and I think that's pretty common. What I usually do is I put in the bubble and then let the retina flatten and then bring them back a day or two later and then do laser treatment. So um, you can go either way. Uh, the argument for doing it the first way, doing the cryo at the same time that you do the bubble, uh, gas bubble injection, is that sometimes the view is a little bit tough and it's hard to do laser treatment. But since we don't have cryo in our office over the past 10 years, I've just gotten used to doing it with the laser. Um, so overall, the, the chance of successfully repairing a retinal detachment is at least 80 to 90 percent. And if somebody's got a giant retinal tear, PVR, uveitis, or cruel detachment or something like that, then the, the chance of successfully repairing the detachment is less. The difference between MAC-on detachments and MAC-off detachments is a big one because if they've got a MAC-on detachment, they've got almost a 90 percent chance of keeping vision that's 2050 or better. If they've got a MAC off detachment, they've only got about a 30% chance of getting vision that's 2050 or better. So as a result, that's a really important distinction to make and it's important to take uh, patients to the operating room in a timely fashion to try to keep them from developing a MAC off detachment if they're starting to get a detachment. So attractional uh, RDs are often, they often have kind of this scaphoid appearance. So um, I just learned this last night. So scaphoid means boat-like or boat-shaped. But what that means is that the detachment kind of looks uh, concave. So you look in there, it's usually got a concave, whereas um, exudative detachments and regmatogenous detachments will often be more convex. It'll be more bolus. So a scaphoid uh, or attractional detachment is often kind of the scaphoid appearance that uh, looks uh, concave. So if you take the traction off a tractional retinal detachment, often it will settle down on its own, provided that there's no regmatogenous detachment or provided that you don't create a tear in the retina while you're trying to peel the membranes off the retina. Uh, of course, that's a no-no. Um, with exudative detachments, you'll sometimes see shifting fluids. So you put the patient upright and the detachment looks one way and then you lay them on their left side and the detachment will go to whatever is the lowest point in their eye. Um, often these retinal detachments are quite smooth and they, don't, they almost never have fixed folds, so they don't get PVR like regmatogenous detachments do. So this is just a busy slide showing the difference. So um, in terms of differential diagnosis for retinal detachments, this is something that I don't think we ought to spend too much time on. It's in your book, uh, it's in the Academy book, but it goes through this whole thing about uh, cystoid degeneration, typical cystoid degeneration versus reticular cystoid degeneration versus typical retinoschisis versus reticular retinoschisis. And frankly, I think clinically, it's very hard to tell the difference. And it essentially just has to do with where the, the retina is split. So with typical cystoid degeneration and typical retinoschisis, it's the outer plexiform layer. With reticular, it's the nerve fiber layer. But clinically, can you tell the difference? I think in most cases not. And I've tried over the years to kind of see when I look at patients with retinoschisis, whether or not it's typical or cystoid. Boy, after 10 years, I still don't think I can tell the difference. So I think that academically, it's probably important to understand that they make distinctions. 
But I think that in many senses, this is kind of a histopathologic thing rather than a real practical, real world clinical thing. So um, the most important thing I can tell you is that it's important to learn how to distinguish retinal detachments from retinoschisis. And this is the type of question I get all the time from referring doctors. Is this schesis or is this a retinal detachment? And so um, there, here are some features that you can use to distinguish the two. In a retinal detachment, the surface often looks corrugated. It looks kind of wrinkly. In retinoschisis, it, it's usually very smooth and domed. In a retinal detachment, hemorrhage or pigment are often present. In retinoschisis, pigment and hemorrhage are almost never there. Uh, in a retinal detachment, they have a relative scotoma, meaning that the peripheral vision affected by the retinal detachment will look kind of gray and hazy, but it won't be completely missing. If they have retinoschisis, that area will be completely dark. Usually they won't even miss it, they won't even know. But one thing that you can do is you can take your scleral depressor and you've got your indirect on and then you can move your scleral depressor into and out of the light. And with a retinal detachment, you can go to normal retina and then you can go to the area of detached retina and they'll say, yeah, it looks a little bit hazier in the area of detachment, but they can still see the shadow of your depressor. If they've got retina schesis, then as you move from normal retina to the area of schesis, they, in theory, will not be able to see your, the shadow of your depressor at all because it's an absolute scotoma. The other thing, too, is that if you shoot that area of schesis or detachment with a laser, if they've got a retinal detachment, then usually the laser won't take up at all because it will hit the RPE, but it won't create any burn in the retina because the retina is detached or separated away from the RPE. If they've got retina schesis, then um, usually when you shoot it with a laser, you'll see uptake of the laser. Sometimes you have to make sure you turn up the power enough, but usually you'll see uptake in the setting of retina schesis. And then shifting fluid, usually with regmatogenous detachments, the fluid doesn't really shift. With retina schesis, it, uh, uh, but sometimes it will kind of shift or move. It kind of undulates a little bit. With retinoschisis, it, it never shifts. So here's some examples. So is this a detachment or is this schesis? Detachment? Is this a detachment or schesis? Good. Is this a detachment or schesis? Detachment. You know that because there's a pigmented demarcation line along the back of the detachment. Is this a detachment or schesis? Yeah. Once again, very regular, smooth, dome-shaped, not corrugated, and no pigment. Is that a detachment or schesis? Detachment. detachment. Is that a detachment or schesis? That's schesis. That's right. So often with schesis, if you can get your OCT out, kind of in the periphery where the area of schesis is, you'll see the photoreceptor cell layer still there, but you'll see that clearly there's this portion of the detachment that's, or excuse me, this portion of the ski that's, that's elevated. And once again, if that's splitting through the outer plexiform layer, it should be splitting through this layer right here. And so anything that's outer plexiform layer and beyond will stay adherent to the wall of the eye. Anything that's inner uh, or more interiorly located to the uh, inner plex outer plexiform layer, you'll see it detached. So you can actually do this, yes? So for a What's that? A serous detachment. Yeah. Versus well, sometimes serous detachments are kind of smooth and regular too, right? So that can give, be kind of a tough distinction to make. But usually with a serous detachment, it, the retina doesn't look quite as thin and atrophic as it does with schesis. So with schesis, usually the retina looks very thin. I mean, it's, it's paper thin so much so that as you're kind of looking through it, um, you can just see the vessels. I, I sometimes tell, oh, that's all you can see. It's hard to see the substance of the retina. Whereas with a serous detachment, um, usually you can see the substance of the retina a little bit. It's a little, just a little bit more opaque. One of the challenges, though, is if somebody's got a chronic retinal detachment, often the retina really thins in those cases, and it can look a lot like a schesis detachment. In fact, I, I saw one of these just a few months ago where the, you know, as an older gentleman, I think 85 or so, came in, the referring ophthalmologist said, I'm not sure if this is schesis or a detachment. And I looked at him and he had some pigment along the posterior margin of the elevated area, which made me think maybe it was a detachment. Uh, I was also able to do uh, an OCT, which showed that it was a detachment and not schesis. And then the third thing is I found a break that told me that it was um, a retinal detachment rather than a schesis. But that detachment had probably been there for well, many months, if not years, probably years. And the, so the retina had become very thin and atrophic. Uh, 
Uh, one thing that you can see, just going back here a little bit, is sometimes you'll see these outer retinal breaks in the setting of retinostesis. So they're uh, breaks in the outer wall of the stesis cavity. And um, these can sometimes turn into a retinal detachment. So you'll have a retinal detachment underneath the stesis. And occasionally, we see that, and you have to treat it like a retinal detachment. If it's far enough peripherally, then you can just laser demarcate around that area, and it's not a big deal. But every once in a while, it requires doing a vitrectomy. All righty, I think that we are close to done. Optic pit maculopathy. How many of you have seen, seen a case of this, optic pit, pit maculopathy? So what you'll see is you'll see this little tiny hole uh, or excavated area at the temporal <coughs> margin of the optic nerve. And then often the OCT looks like this. And so, um, so I did one of these maybe all, I think it was late last year, it was in December of last year, so it's about nine months ago. I took it to the OR, I did a vitrectomy, I peeled the ILM and uh, put an SF6 gas bubble in his eye. And he came back like a month later and he had a full thickness macular hole. Ah, this is the worst, because it looked just like this, where he had like a little tiny roof over the cyst and he had an opening there. But the weirdest thing was is that that macular hole spontaneously resolved over the next couple of months. I've never seen anything quite like it. But the nice thing is is that he's doing great. He started out being 2400, and I think he's now down to 2050 or 2060. These usually have a poor prognosis if you don't do anything at all. So the things that you can do is you can put laser treatment right along here to try to keep the fluid from seeping out and getting underneath the macula. Uh, you can also put a gas bubble in there and try to push the fluid out. Um, or you can do vitrectomy, and those are the three options for this. I've, uh, I've never put the, just a gas bubble alone, but I have done laser treatment and I've done vitrectomy for these. And in my experience, the thing that works the best is vitrectomy. So I think that for me going forward, Whenever I see somebody with optic pit maculopathy, they're always going to be operating room and getting a vitrectomy. Peeling the ILM is probably a little bit more controversial. It's, I'm not sure whether or not it's helpful or useful, but I think doing vitrectomy with laser treatment right along the edge of the optic nerve is often definitive and takes care of the problem. Whereas I've often been underwhelmed with the response of laser treatment at the margin of the optic disc. Furthermore, as I've reviewed the literature on that, it just doesn't seem like it's got the best success rate. I mean, it's probably somewhere like, you know, a third of patients end up having the fluid kind of go away. So not a robust response. But anyway, I think that that is about the end. Do you have any questions about anything that we talked about today? Okay.